Section 9 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. The Laurels and the Lady. Part three. Part seven. Compared with this new and stupendous difficulty, the dreaded need for meeting his demand for the copies of his reveries appeared a simple matter enough. When she came next, she placed a parcel on his knees, with so little misgiving that she was surprised at herself. The poet gave a cry of delight. My book! It's my book! She told him to cut the string, but his fingers shook and he couldn't manage it. Oh, I can't! You! She took the penknife from him and then let him unfold the wrappings himself. Six volumes met his touch with an electric thrill, all alike, but each to be caressed apart from the others, each of them lovable and delicious. How delicate was the surface that he stroked! he was holding his first-born and he thanked god the emotion was the true emotion though it was conjured up by fraud it was the bliss of ignorance but none the less bliss he was holding his first-born and polly had given him a joy no meaner than heaven would have given had it granted him the power that he fancied he had displayed six copies of another work and imagination were as potent as reality tell me what it's like he whispered it is she said a pale curious fawn the edges are stained a deeper shade and the name of william childers is at the bottom of the cover a little to the right in dark antique lettering let me trace it show me she obeyed terrified watching his efforts breathlessly i can't make it out but it looks well eh it looks well it looks beautiful she said the paper's thin he murmured i'd hope they'd give me better paper it's thin she confessed remorsefully but very good-looking i think it looks more uncommon than if it had been thick and the type big is there a wide margin there's a very wide margin asserted polly give me your finger again there all that is margin and the type splendid i can read it from here she could she could read the norman conquest edward was not a vigorous king he had little authority while he cuddled the book with a long-drawn sigh of content perhaps soon i shall be able to see it rosa when do we go need we wait long i'm on fire but oh i'm happy too happy happy i'm happier than i ever hoped to be although i've no eyes since i knew you my whole life has changed how can i repay you suddenly a passionate desire seized him read me the first poem he prayed read me seek eater at astra let me hear rosa duchene speak my verse she stood speechless her head was swimming rosa wait she stammered it's new to me you are a poet and it's new to me wait till i know them willie i have a reputation to lose she thanked her guiding star she had retained the manuscript and he his disappointment passing thought how sweet was this timidity in such a woman he told her his thought with triumphant tenderness she resolved that he should have plenty of opportunities for the triumph in future she had proposed that on the journey before them she should adopt his surname to explain the unavoidable suggestion she had urged that while duchene's features might be familiar to many duchene's name would be known to all and entail perpetual embarrassment in agreeing with this he had removed her initial anxiety from her mind freed from it she made the needful preparations with less of fright in her soul 
and now since they were to go she was sometimes eager for them to be gone soon there was the contingency that a man might drop in on him and at the final instant destroy the whole fabric of the deception that she had weaved she strove to persuade herself that she might preserve her lover's delusion more securely where she had only strangers to fear than she could have done on the diamond fields but then her reason mocked her for the hope so many things might happen she dared not look ahead alternately she longed and trembled for the hour that was to see them start she was fighting pluckily but in moments the enormity of the undertaking to which she had set her hand paralyzed her and at every step she seemed called upon to vanquish a further obstacle that had not been suspected till it barred the way when the morning broke at last her predominant sensation was pleasure her own luggage was ready and while bad shilling went for their breakfast she was busy packing the remaining things of willie's she was still on her knees endeavouring to fasten the box while willie sat on it when the boy returned his additional weight for he was a boy of about forty years of age weighing twelve stones disposed of the matter and they sat down to the coffee and steaks at the untidy table gaily reminding each other that it was for the last time the negro had come back with a cart and the meal concluded they made haste to leave as they mounted to their seats the doors of the cottage and of all the sheds about the works banged violently the long low swishing sound was heard that heralded a dust storm in another minute the air was dark and they hid their faces to shield them from the hissing stinging grit such dust storms were of constant occurrence but in this one the little hottentot driver appeared to read a warning for he lashed forward the horses furiously they gained the station before the rain that he had foreseen began to fall but it did fall in floods sweeping less fortunate animals off their feet and polly's cheerfulness deserted her as she glanced back into the deluge superstitiously she felt that the adventure had opened under ominous conditions part eight however the thirty-odd hours in the train were uneventful and they reached cape town safely again both were exhilarated the comparative freshness of the atmosphere to her the sparkle of the sea beyond the jetty and to him the scent of it the odour of flowers and the rustle of trees were delicious after the desert they had left and he drove in a hansom again a white hansom with a coloured driver truly but a hansom they went straight to a little inn of which polly had heard outside the town it seemed to her to be almost at the foot of the mountain whose squareness broke off so sharply against the intense blue sky and obtaining rooms they sat down and smiled at each other in delight how clean everything feels said willie the towels and the chair covers it's jolly she had been thinking so too inside it was clean and outside it was green and tranquil the road that the hostel overlooked was at this part an avenue of firs glinting here and there with branches of the silver leaves that are sent to england as birthday cards with stiff little views or sentiments painted on them presently a malay maid servant a starched white triangle from the armpits down with a bright silk fez upon her head came in with their dinner and they tasted fruit once more not fruit as it was procurable in kimberley but luscious peaches and purple figs and a watermelon plucked since an hour they sat dawdling over their coffee by the window while the moon rose and now and again the thrum of a banjo was borne to them on the stillness and childers smoked a cigarette because the situation seemed to call for one though he enjoyed it only with his fingers now in the morning they took one of the trains that pottered between the suburbs and cape town and sent the cablegram to the solicitor but they were not impatient for the money to arrive they contemplated with fortitude the two or three days that they would have to pass here when the answer came and they left the bank with a roll of notes in polly's pocket they went to the office of the company that had a boat sailing next 
to engage their passages and here they met with their first disappointment all the berths were booked and it was necessary for them to wait for the union steamer which left a week later it was disconcerting but it couldn't be helped after all they were comfortable at the inn and though childers experienced more regret than polly he was not very seriously chagrined either they walked home talking for it was an agreeable walk after one had passed the smell of the tannery at pappendorp he spoke of the suspense in which he waited to learn how the critics received reveries the humiliation he would feel if they sneered at it and then the girl told him how the scene about them looked of the fields of arum lilies despised like buttercups in england of the clusters of maidenhair fern fluttering in every hedge look she exclaimed oh i'm sorry i mean how sweet this is will this villa those high cactuses cacti what is it divide us from the garden but here at the gate one can see in the lawn is yellow with loquat trees and crimson with japonicas it's all patches of colour and shadow and it's got a perfect duck of a step and oh a lovely old negress with white hair who's coming down to us let's go on she'd bother us to go over it perhaps it's to let we shall find a difference when we get to london shan't we he said fancy it january the cold the wet the bustling crowds in the foggy streets and the mud carts slopping over what a contrast london has got suburbs too dulwich where you lived is a suburb isn't it it wouldn't be like that if we went to dulwich no he said we shouldn't find crowds in dulwich because the people who live there never go out and there'd be no mud carts because in deadly dulwich the mud is never cleared away but its long dreary desolate roads aren't like this one in the least cape town appeared to him in spite of his affliction much more attractive now than it had done eighteen months before when he saw it the thought occurred to him that he might turn their enforced delay to account by consulting one of its medical men and obtaining a second and more authoritative opinion he mentioned the idea to polly and she ascertained that the best man to whom he could go was an englishman dr eben drysdale they heard very encouraging accounts of his ability though not a specialist he had effected some remarkable cures in ophthalmic cases it was said and after polly had written for an appointment willie grew more and more excited at the prospect of the visit the girl herself did not know what to desire as they mounted the steps of the house her knees knocked together to hope the man might say that no operation would succeed sounded so heartless that she was ashamed to look at willie while her struggle with the hope was going on yet for his sight to be restored would mean a tragedy for them both she often prayed though to many it may sound improbable and she shaped an inward irresolute prayer as they stood waiting to be admitted she said oh god you know all about it help me to want the thing that he'll like best in appearance dr drysdale was not impressive when willie had finished explaining he said yes yes to be sure and you're on your way back to the old country eh well let's see let's have a look he put on a strange contrivance and examined the eyes through a peephole in it and how long is it since the trouble began my sight has been weak for a long while it's been getting very bad for the last eight months and about nine weeks ago it failed altogether at least i wore a shade for a few days and then yes yes said dr drysdale can anything be done asked polly the doctor pondered well i wouldn't say that no one over there would advise an operation you might go to follett or to mcintyre i dare say mcintyre might do it and it's possible it might be partially successful but your husband she bowed the question is whether it's good enough for him to go to england on the chance anyhow i shouldn't recommend him to live there i don't understand said willie heavily it wouldn't do your lungs any good you know 
here you've everything in your favour my advice to you is to stay where you are let's tap you about a bit you might take off your coat and waistcoat yes and your shirt too now then draw a deep breath again my lungs aren't strong stammered willie i know they never have been but what you're implying's news to me polly rose in consternation do you mean that he's ill doctor very ill i mean said dr drysdale suddenly evasive that i wouldn't recommend england for him that's all it isn't a climate that we choose when there's a tendency to any pulmonary complaint and and as your husband says his lungs aren't exactly strong there was a pause that lasted some time we may as well go said childers at last i'm glad to have had your opinion good morning but as polly went to the head of the stairs he turned and spoke to the doctor hurriedly on the threshold i want it straight please he said in a low voice if i live in england how long shall i last one can't say said the other deprecatingly nature at times roughly i'm not a child how long so far as i can judge from a cursory examination i should give you about two years good god and here here with care and if you avoid excitement you may live for ten more but you must avoid excitement mind the girl was coming back eager to miss nothing Willie heard the frou-frou of her skirt. "'If I can't avoid excitement,' he questioned desperately, "'if that's impossible.' The doctor shrugged his shoulders. "'You won't live so long.' Part 9 Willie and Paul Patchouli left the house silently. She could not express her comprehension in words, and she loathed the passers-by that prevented her taking him to her heart. To him the shock was awful. Now he knew the meaning of various sensations that he had set down to lassitude and depression. She squeezed the hand that rested on her arm. "'My poor boy,' she said. "'It's, it's rather hard lines, isn't it?' She noted absently the brutal blue of the sky, the fierceness with which the bay sparkled. The noise of a little traffic in the road was deafening. "'You must stop in Cape Town and get well,' she murmured. "'Are we going back by train?' "'Yes,' he said drearily. "'I suppose so.' His thought was not that his sight was lost for ever, not that England would never now be anything to him but a memory. It was that she and he must separate. She would go, perhaps a little later than they were to have gone together, perhaps much later, but she would go. It seems that it was fated, he said. What was fated? He had taken it for granted that she must be thinking of the same thing, but she was suffering with her own identity and had not remembered to view the situation as Duchesne. Why, that you were to leave me out here after all. Leave you? Then realizing the position, she was staggered. Would Duchesne leave him, or would she stay, regardless of everything else? She didn't know. It looked to her impossible that Rosa Duchesne would renounce her career and become the jest of Europe in order to remain with Willie in Cape Town. But mightn't it look impossible, because Rosa Duchesne was nothing but a great name to her? She was a woman, too. If a great woman loved him just as much— wouldn't she now be suffering just as much? Wouldn't she ache to stay with him just as much as she herself was aching? It was so difficult. We must think about it, she said. Would consent entail discovery? Or was his belief in the actress's devotion equal to accepting such a sacrifice without suspicion? As the train bore them homeward, she sat staring from the window asking herself the question. She was now grateful for the presence of strangers. She did not want to speak. On the platform Willie exclaimed, "'What do I care? 
we'll go together all the same i'd rather be with you and die rosa than be left alone and live don't let's think about it any more we'll go as we'd arranged are you mad she cried he persisted but she would not listen to him and all the afternoon she waited trying to perceive whether he was ready to receive the suggestion that she craved to make during the evening both were very quiet she had wheeled her armchair to the sofa where he lay and stooped from time to time to kiss him but her sympathy seemed empty to him without the words that he was yearning to hear and to herself till the words were spoken the caresses that she could not restrain seemed almost an insult when shall you sail he asked breaking a long silence when you are tired of me she answered oh you'll go before then really coquetry appeared heartless to him he wondered at her for the first time i wish you were a nobody i've been too vain perhaps of being loved by rosa duchene now i'm punished for it it's your position that comes between us her lover or her career what woman would hesitate he did not know it but in his tone was the reproach that was her clue she shivered with joy before she spoke i can't tell you what woman would hesitate she said with a laugh what do you mean he faltered supposing she said twisting a piece of his hair round her finger supposing he echoed breathlessly supposing that once upon a time there was an actress who came to south africa and met a man she was fool enough to like very much to love very much to love as i love you suppose they had meant to go to london together and then one morning learnt that the boy was too ill that the woman must give up everything to stay with him or go away alone and give up him if through that first dreadful day she wasn't able to decide if just at first she did hesitate if she tried to stamp her love out only to find that it was worth more to her than the stage than her paris than her life if she cried to him willie i'm ashamed forgive me and let me stop what do you think the man would say rosa he gasped i love you i love you i love you she muttered straining him to her you won't have so long to wait as you think i shan't last more than three or four years even here you shall live for ever she swore you shall be immortal they went the following day to view the little house that had delighted her so much it was to be let furnished and the old white-haired negress that she had seen in the garden was prepared to remain as servant they settled to take it then and there and less than a week later they were installed the afternoon that they moved in polly went into town alone she explained that there was something she wanted to buy a shade for the parlor lamp and willie who was vividly interested in the arrangement of their home although he could not see it said let it be a pretty color darling something that'll make the room nice to look at in the evening she left him on the step where she could see him at the moment she reached the gate on her return but when her purchase was made she did not hasten to rejoin him there she turned up adderley street instead into an avenue near the foot there was a big building it was the public library and she entered it please she said nervously to a gentleman who was standing behind the counter i want a criticism of a book of poems it doesn't matter who wrote them but they must be fine poems and the critic must say that the poet's a genius could you help me the gentleman was taken aback what kind of poet he inquired there have been many fine poets do you mean a poet who is still living i really don't mind at all whether he's living or dead said polly impartially so long as he's good enough well we have just received a work that might suit you how would this do he handed her victorian poets by stedman 
if you go into the reading-room you can look through it she clutched the fat green volume thankfully and taking a chair at one of the tables where there were pens and ink hurriedly skimmed the contents the names looked promising tennyson browning swinburne a host met her eye including dozens of whom she had never heard to her impatience however it soon seemed that the author found more faults than merits in even the best of them nowhere could she come across exactly what she sought at last after infinite pains she selected a lot of appreciative paragraphs and managed to dovetail them into a fairly consistent whole but a panegyric on byron which she saw too late for it to be inserted satisfactorily without her omitting a eulogy of keats detracted from her satisfaction i'm very much obliged she said to the librarian did you find what you wanted he asked curiously yes thank you she said at least it'll do to go on with but i shall often have to come again she now proceeded to the station and she reached the garden as the sun was setting willie was still where she had left him in her hand was a copy of a london paper a paper that he had often referred to with awe and anticipation she put her sheet of fool's cap on the rustic table and gave him the paper sweetheart she said i've brought you your first review he turned very pale his voice was tremulous what do they say what's in it she told him the paper's name i'll read it to you she took a seat by the table and read the minor poetry of the last few years she began is of a strangely composite order we can see that the long popular browning at length has become a potent force as the pioneer of a half dramatic half psychological method whose adherents seek a change from the idyllic repose of tennyson and his followers with this intent and with a strong leaning towards the art studies and convictions of the rossetti group a neo-romantic school has arisen in which mr william childers whose reveries is now under our consideration leaps at a bound into the foremost place his songs resemble those of rossetti in terseness and beauty while with browning they escape at times to that stronghold whither science and materialism are not prepared to follow art so complex as mr childers was not possible until centuries of literature had passed and an artist could overlook the field essay each style and evolve a metrical result which should be to that of earlier periods what the music of meyerbeer and rossini is to the narrower range of piccini or gluck all must acknowledge that sic itur et astra is perfect of its kind take this and that exquisite ode to a memory or my soul and i we call them poetry poetry of the lasting sort and attractive to successive generations we believe that they will be read when many years have passed away that they will be picked out and treasured by future compilers she paused that he might breathe half an acre of heaven had fallen into the rondebosch garden and its glory was flooding him after a few seconds she bent again over her manuscript and read on for several minutes to the end when she had finished they did not speak she lay her head on his breast while his soul uttered thanksgiving on the heights to which her lie had lifted him he had touched the pinnacle he was thrilled with an intenser joy than comes to one man among millions a joy so vast that few of us have the imagination to conceive it happy happy you and fame could life give any more the brief cape twilight was beginning to fall and she guided him inside she led him into a chair and kissed him his lips and his sightless eyes your chair in our home she murmured oh and the lampshade here it is what colour did you choose rosa it's couleur de rose said polly and she put it on some months later on the border of mowbray and rondebosch there lingered in the last weeks of his life 
a famous poet he had never spoken with his publishers but from time to time they wrote to him in terms of respectful admiration and then the celebrated actress who shared his exile and acted as his amanuensis read their letters to him and cashed the very small drafts that they apologetically enclosed at the primitive shops from which the villa was supplied its tenants were known as mr and mrs childers but as they had not been seen at church none of the neighbours had called on them nor in fact did any one suspect their great importance and as the poet being blind was always attended by the actress he made no acquaintance when he was out he had just published his second work which had enhanced the reputation won by his first the volumes were beloved belongings from the shelf on which they were kept he often took them down and fondled them to a stranger parting the expensive covers the contents might have been startling in view of so much pride he might indeed have been pardoned the impression that he was looking at mavor's spelling-book and a child's history of england but the poet held them with rejoicing to clasp them was rapture second only to clasping his companion a plain young woman whom he addressed by another woman's name and passionately believed most beautiful End of section 9section number 10 of the man who understood woman and other stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jason in panama the man who understood women and other stories by leonard merrick chapter 10 the child in the garden when he reached the village of Thergramebs at last, and after Athens the journey had been extremely trying, the curate gathered that Miss Netterville was out. As it was six months since they had met, and he had written to her that he was coming, her fiancé was vexed. The innkeeper had laid eager hands on the portmanteau, and the traveller signed to him imperatively to put it down. No, no, he exclaimed, I must sleep somewhere else, if there's another inn to be found in the hole he remembered that it was useless to inquire for one in english upon my word his thoughts ran it's most annoying of course we can't both lodge in the same house and none of these peasants will understand a word i say how very tiresome to be sure really it's most inconsiderate of gertrude to be out when i arrive i shall have to be very firm with her i see that i shall have to speak even more strongly than i intended it was midday and the sun was blazing the straggling white road baked under his dusty boots the heat and the thought that miss netterville would probably return to luncheon to say nothing of the difficulty of seeking accommodation without an interpreter decided the curate to remain for a while a lemon squash he commanded at a venture bring me a lemon squash and then as the order produced only smiles and shrugs he raised a hand to his mouth with a gesture which he felt to be rather southern and graceful. The landlord responded volubly, and though he brought wine instead, the Reverend Aloysius Chasel was too thirsty and fatigued to make objections to it. He sat in a little vine-clad arbor, with the wine on a bench, and his portmanteau at his side, and was much inclined to wish that he had not left Bedfordshire. The situation was undignified from first to last, he felt. It was no less than three years now since Gertrude had promised to be his wife, and their marriage had been delayed for nothing but the scientific coldness of the young woman's disposition. When a girl who was betrothed to a Church of England clergyman, with private means, allowed him to pine for her in his parish while she devoted herself to the study of archaeology abroad, it was time for the clergyman to put his foot down thought aloysius and that was what he had travelled from bedfordshire to do meanwhile miss netterville was trudging along the road to greet him with a frown on her intellectual brow she was quite aware that she was treating him unfairly and surmised pretty shrewdly what he had come to say and it would all be a great bore 
the idea of marriage had never attracted her at any time man other than prehistoric had always been rather repellent to her than the reverse and she wondered why she had been weak enough to disturb her life by becoming engaged she approached the arbor with no enthusiasm hello al she said i didn't expect you so early have you been here long i've been here the best part of an hour replied aloysius it was disappointing to find you were not at home well how are you gertrude aren't you going to kiss me she inclined a cheek awkwardly such physical expressions of good feeling were distasteful to her and she stared at the portmanteau what did you bring your bag out here for she asked why didn't you take it upstairs upstairs echoed the curate it must be taken to another hotel but i can't speak to these people i had to wait till you came in i'm afraid that there's nothing else resembling a hotel for miles she said thergromebs is rather primitive you know it seems so primitive that i'm dismayed to find you in it but with all your contempt for the conventions i suppose you don't want us to be talked about surely you understand that it's out of the question for us both to sleep under the same roof in the circumstances oh my dear aloysius she cried please spare me the artificialities go to one of the goat herd's cottages if any of them has a bed to offer and you care to lie in it but don't talk to me as if i were an ingenue in bedfordshire i've got beyond that sort of thing have they given you anything to eat lunch will be ready directly we may as well go inside gertrude he began strenuously i've something to say to you and it's just as well to say it at once your letters haven't been very satisfactory over and over again you've left a question of mine unanswered we've been engaged for three years now and i want you to fix a day for our wedding will you marry me next month next month oh no it's impossible but why frankly dear i am losing patience why is it always impossible marriage needn't interfere with your work you can write quite as easily when we're married as you do now in bedfordshire she said with a fine smile i don't approve of the tone in which you mention bedfordshire exclaimed aloysius i presume that a book may be written in bedfordshire as well as in thergramabs or in egypt or any other of the remote places that you've a craze for the whole thing is preposterous it looks a little like affectation it would be preposterous for a girl of twenty-eight to roam about the world unprotected in any case unprotected she echoed unprotected you are talking a language that i've forgotten really your notions are the most antique things in greece i say that it would be preposterous for a young girl to roam about the world alone in any case you might be robbed and murdered here and considering that you're engaged to me it's more preposterous still it puts me in a very false position and it's not an easy matter to explain people have begun to talk in bedfordshire she inquired again yes in bedfordshire and they would talk in bloomsbury or belgravia or anywhere else it's not proper gertrude it is thought very improper indeed you must remember that you are young and pretty and oh don't she said wearily what an odious word i'm not accustomed to consider my personal appearance but i do trust that i'm not pretty my sister often says that you would be extremely pretty returned aloysius if you didn't strain your hair back and paid more attention to your clothes but your prettiness is not the point the main thing is our engagement you haven't the right to behave like this you aren't free to indulge your eccentricities you owe a duty to me miss netterville lit a cigarette and gazed thoughtfully across a mulberry tree characteristically she had made no change in her costume on the day of her lover's arrival and she had stated a fact when she declared herself indifferent to her appearance as a rule but in spite of the ill-fitting blouse the unbecomingly dressed blonde hair in spite even of the coldly intellectual eyes she looked a desirable woman a psychologist might have thought she looked also a woman with potentialities but aloysius was not a psychologist he saw only the obvious and not the whole of that of course i am to blame she said at last i know but then i never pretended to the kind of temperament that you admire to me my paramount duty must always be my work to you my paramount duty is to do the sort of thing that any other woman could do equally well it is curious that i appeal to you 
to be quite candid love in its physical aspects is unpleasant to me quite apart from the fact that marriage would be an abominable hindrance to my studies i have no gift for domesticity the prospect of district visiting appalls me and tea parties bore me to death and i have no leaning towards maternity i oughtn't to have promised to marry you at all i have more important things to do in my life there are shoals of women capable of adding to the world's population but the women capable of adding to its store of knowledge are comparatively few you are expressing yourself very strangely muttered the curate very strangely indeed if i understand you you are breaking our engagement off i don't want to be unkind she said but i am quite sure that you ought to do better that is a matter on which you must allow me to judge for myself on which i did judge for myself when i proposed to you i could certainly wish that you held more feminine views and that you did not express the views that you do hold with such unusual bluntness but for good or ill i love you you must admit that to break off our engagement after all this time would be to treat me cruelly i really don't know what i could say to people you could say that you had given me up everybody would consider you were quite justified i am not in the habit of telling falsehoods gerstrude i should have to acknowledge that you had thrown me over at the end of three years after i had travelled to greece to see you i had looked forward to a tenderer conclusion to the journey i must say he too regarded the mulberry tree i i am not unreasonable i quite appreciate your interest in your work archaeology is a very interesting subject i am sure and miss netterville made a gesture of impatience please don't patronize the ages you mean well but it's irritating i was about to explain that if next month would be inconvenient to you on literary grounds i would cheerfully wait until the month after said aloysius with pained surprise let us both make concessions let us say in two months time eh dearest we have both let our tongues run away with us haven't we both been a little hasty what do you say you shall share my study you shall have your own shelves in it only the other day i was looking at a little bamboo desk in the high street and thinking how admirably it would suit you i'd write my sermons while you wrote your book and sometimes we might turn round and read each other what we had done wouldn't it be cosy now doesn't it sound pleasant she shuddered and nerved herself for a supreme effort al she stammered it has been a shocking mistake i can't marry you and the curate did not sleep anywhere at all in thergrimibs he left it the same evening when he bade her good-bye he said i have released you from your promise gertrude because you forced me to do so but i shan't cease to long for you and if you ever change your mind you must let me know think things over after i have gone i shall always be hoping to hear from you then he climbed into the crazy vehicle and was jolted over the white road again a disconsolate figure beside the portmanteau that had not been unpacked and miss netterville went moodily to her work thergrimebs consists of its dilapidated inn and a sprinkling of hovels half-naked children swarm in the dust and beg of any misguided tourist who happens to stray there from the towns beyond goat herds dignified in their rags roll cigarettes pensively and prematurely old women occasionally appear at the doors and shade their eyes in the sun these are almost the only signs of activity in thergrimebs for the rest you have silence and the mountains miss netterville made many expeditions up the mountains equipped with a scribbling block and a fountain pen she often wrote among them one evening she had now written thirty thousand words and aloysius had been gone about a month she heard the slow sound of hoofs two quaintly garbed men were riding down the track they had evidently just observed her and as she turned one of them waved his sombrero to her with an impudent smile he was the taller of the pair a swarthy handsome fellow with laughing eyes and a big moustache that curled above full sensual lips she bent over her manuscript again with a frown wondering why his glance had affected her so queerly the men quickened their pace and then dismounted and advanced to her her emotion was pure fear now she got up trembling there is nothing to do she is alone said the smaller of the two a weedy villain with a squint 
You will find you have more to do than you think, she boasted coolly. I am armed. So you understand Greek, do you? exclaimed his companion. That's all the better. I like a girl to be able to talk to me. You are going to have a ride with me, my beauty. If you don't come quietly, I shall have to be rough. How is it to be? He learned how it was to be at once. Miss Netterville struck at the handsome face straight from the shoulder, throwing her body into the blow with capital effect, and took to flight as he reeled back. But the next instant he rushed after her. He seized her before she had covered a dozen yards. Now there was no chance to strike him. An arm flung round her held her fast, and she could only scream for help. He swung her off her feet and stumbled with her towards the saddle. His laboring breath was in her face, but his eyes laughed into her own, though the blood that she had drawn was trickling round his mouth. As he rode off with her, crushed against him, she could feel the heaving of his breast under her cheek. They rode some distance with her cheek strained against his breast before he spoke. Anathema ton! What a spitfire you are, he panted. Look what your fist has done. Don't you think you owe me a kiss for that? You brute, she gasped. I'd like to kill you. You're a regular devil of a woman. I didn't know they made them like you with that colored hair. You're hurting my arm, she moaned. I can't bear it any longer. Will you sit still if I don't hold so tight? I couldn't escape even if I jumped off. That's true, said the brigand, but I don't want the job of getting you up again. If I had your weight in gold, my dear, I'd lead an easy life. He slackened his grasp a little and flashed his bold, impudent smile at her, the smile that had shamed her so hotly when she first saw him. Come, it's not disagreeable to be hugged by a man. Own up. It would be very shocking if you could help it, but you can't. Remind yourself that you're not to blame, and then you can have a good time. Where are you taking me? To my hotel, said the facetious outlaw. What do you mean? Call it a cave if you like. I'm not proud, and I have a fancy for a quiet spot. But there's room enough for you in it, and food and wine. We'll have a bottle together. Don't look so frightened. I'll release you safe and sound when the ransom is paid. I take my oath. Miss Netterville stared into the twilight. She might tell him that there was no one to ransom her. But if he believed the statement, he would probably be reckless how he treated her, she thought. Her only safeguard was to leave him the illusion that her safety would be paid for heavily. How much do you demand? I shall open my mouth jolly wide. You are a pretty woman. You would be very vexed if I put a low price on you. He broke into a roar of laughter and clasped her more caressingly. His good humor was not without a reassuring effect. The scoundrel was very human, and her horror of him had partially subsided. Indeed, as they rode out on this close embrace, she marveled that she could bear the ignominy of it with such fortitude. It was a long ride. Her thoughts wandered in it, and curious fancies crossed her mind. She thought of Aloysius, and wished that he were different. It occurred to her that it would be pleasant to be clasped to Aloysius like this, always with the proviso, if he were different, and then she reflected that the ride itself would be pleasant if the brigand were a gentleman, and their embrace were right. Insensibly she yielded to it more and more. It grew less repugnant to her, and even, with a shock she realized what she had been feeling, and shivered with self-disgust. We have arrived, said the brigand. He carried her inside. It is nice to carry you, now that you don't struggle, he added. On entering, she was plunged into darkness so intense that she could discern nothing whatsoever. Then she found herself born into a cave illumined by pendant oil lamps and furnished with considerable comfort. Beyond was a second cleft of light, and she perceived that the cave resembled a suite of rooms communicating with one another by means of apertures in the rock. The man who had assisted in her capture rejoined her now, and three others appeared, who saluted her with quiet satisfaction. There was no excitement, no hint of violence. To her surprise, her reception was as formal as if she had arrived at an inn, as formally as innkeepers the brigands prepared to keep her prisoner. Excepting the captain. The captain, as has been seen, did his business with Bonomi. If not the mildest-mannered man that ever cut a throat, 
at least he was the most jovial. No gallant ever filled a lady's glass, or peeled her figs with more consideration, and when he told the company how valiantly she had defended herself, he testified to her prowess with so much humour that she couldn't restrain a smile. At the same time, it was with no little trepidation that she found herself alone with him again when the meal was finished. It proved necessary to confess that she had no friends in Greece with whom he could communicate, and, moreover, that none of her friends in England was in a position to ransom her. He twirled his moustache thoughtfully when she explained. No lover? he questioned. Rubbish! You mustn't tell me that you have no lover. A woman like you. It is true, she declared. Nor a husband? No. I was to have married, but I changed my mind. Diabole! He had no blood in his veins, or he would have carried you off like me. Well, it seems that I have made a bungle, eh? Women are all liars, but every man is a fool once, and I believe you. So I have had a punch in the face for nothing? That's a nice thing. I have a watch on, she suggested. You can take that if you like. It was a little Swiss watch that had cost thirty shillings. He looked at it and gave a shrug. Is that what you offer me to let you go? I think you are worth more. I have nothing else to offer. Besides, although I haven't any friends to pay a ransom, there are plenty of people to miss me. The search might not do me much good, but it would probably end in your being shot. As you can't hope to make any money by me, you'd be wise to set me free. You have brains, too, under that lovely hair, he remarked, appreciatively. May I offer you a cigarette? No, she said, but she eyed the packet wistfully and wished that her case were in her pocket. Now you are being a little donkey. Why should I wait to drug you with a cigarette when I could tap you on the head with one of these? He touched the pistols in the sash wound round his sturdy waist. You see I am smoking them myself. Take your choice among the lot. Miss Netterville and the brigand smoked in silence for a few moments. Then... Every man is a fool once, he repeated meditatively, but there must be a limit to his folly. If I set you free like this, what sort of ass would you think me? No better than the wooer who let you change your mind. I should think you had acted like a brave and generous fellow. Ah, you want to flatter me into it, you cunning cat, he said. Do you know that I could love you desperately, my beauty with the yellow hair? I believe I fell in love with you when I felt your fist. I like you for having hit me. I should like you to hit me again. Come and hit me again, beauty with the yellow hair, or sing me a love song. Do you sing? No, she murmured. It's a pity, for you were a passionate woman. You would have sung well. Why did you start? She had started to discover that this bandit knew her better than she had known herself until an hour ago. I didn't start, she answered. Fire has no heat, and there is no water in the rivers. All things are as the right woman says, he rejoined. So you did not start, beauty, though you have shaken the ash off your cigarette on to your knees. Well, I will sing to you instead. I will sing at your feet while my poor comrades have only their cards to play with. It is good to be the captain sometimes. It is good tonight. He twanged the strings and broke into a serenade. The deep voice was untrained, but rich and sweet. After the first surprise, Miss Netterville forgot who it was that sang. It was an artist on the stage, a lover below a window, almost it was her own lover, whom she loved. The music knocked at her heart, and no trace of the smile that discomfited her so was on the handsome face now. Sentiment idealized the ruffian. When he finished, she was very pale. Are you as cold as the woman of the song, he whispered. Yes, she muttered, I am as cold. You lie, he cried, you love me. And the next instant she snatched a pistol from his sash. I'll kill myself, she gasped. She thought her wrist was broken as she dropped the weapon. He picked it up and paced the cave with agitation, smiting his chest and ejaculating. Meanwhile, the English lady marveled why she didn't loathe him. Will you go? he exclaimed suddenly. You shall go now, if you wish it. I swear you shall be guided back. I love you, I adore you, I implore you to stay. Do you wish to go? 
she bowed her head. I wish to go. He called to the men, and she heard their wonderment, their departing footsteps, at last the clip-clop sound of the hoofs outside. All this time the captain had stood brooding silently. Now he raised his head, and she saw with emotion that tears were in his eyes. Goodbye, Zuemu, he said. Oh, she faltered, did you really love me then? He opened his arms, and Miss Netterville gave herself to them with impetuous lips. All is ready for the lady, came the shout. They are waiting for you, said the brigand sadly. There, there's no hurry for a minute, Miss Netterville heard herself reply. Before she left him he assured her that her escort might be trusted, and no mishap befell her on the road. But she had lost her nerve. A few days later she returned to England, and, perhaps she no longer considered protection so superfluous, she married Aloysius the following month though he did not deem it necessary to inform him of her adventure. They have been married for some years now, and get on together as well as most people. Aloysius has obtained an excellent living, and the eldest of their children is a little son, who engrosses his mother's attention to the exclusion of archaeology. If it were not for her son's favorite game, the vicar's wife might think less often of her strange experience, but the boy tilts his straw hat like a sombrero, and sticks a pop-gun in his sash, and pretends that the summer-house is the brigand's cave. At such times Aloysius remarks humorously that a little brigand is an inappropriate to a vicarage garden, and the lady's eyes are wide. End of section 10「Section number 11 of The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Man Who Understood Women and Other Stories by Leonard Merrick. Chapter 11. A Letter to the Duchess. You said to me last night, Duchess, you are a great musician, Sokolowski, but a great musician may be a great fool. I had vexed you. If I should not know that, forgive me. Perhaps it is common of me to recognize that I vexed you. I shall always be ignorant of the best manners. Pray be indulgent to my ignorance. Pray let me write to you boldly, because I have something to say. But how difficult it is. I am a vulgarian who can express himself only by his violin. I want to say that when you looked at me so kindly, I was not the dolt and ingrate that I seemed. I was very proud, very honored. If I appeared insensible of your interest, it was because I had just been stricken by a grief which I dared not hint. I arrived at your house late last night. You will be revolted to learn what delayed me. When my recital was over, and I had escaped from the fashionable ladies who scrambled to kiss my hands and pull buttons from my coat as keepsakes, I hurried to a minor music hall to hear a girl in tinsel sing a trashy song. I hurried there because I loved her, Duchess, and I had much to think of when I left. To understand what was in my heart when I reached your drawing room, you must read my love story from the beginning, my very vulgar love story that will disgust you. Most of the things that you have seen about me in the papers were false anecdotes invented by my agent. The public ask for anecdotes of their favorite artists, and it is business to give the public what they want. I generally play the music that they want, though it is seldom the music that I like best. I say that most of the things you have heard about me were false, but this much is true. My father was a peasant, and I have fiddled in a fair. I was happy, I have been told of artists who suffered agonies in their youth, always tortured by ambition and dismayed by their obscurity. With me, it was quite different. I was more joyous in a tent than I am now on the platforms. I even knew at the time that I was happy. That says much. Ungrateful, perhaps I sound to you? Still, I shall be frank. I was 13 when I first heard the words, you will be famous. I was on my way to buy some apples, and the discussion that detained me bored me a great deal. 
So ignorant was I that I swear to you, fame said no more to me than that one day I should fiddle with a roof of wood over my head, and that storekeepers and farmers would spell my name from a bill at the doors. My patron had me educated. To him I owe not only my position in the musical world, but the fact that I am able to write this letter. I shall not weary you by describing the years of study. When I began to understand what lay before me, my apprenticeship looked like an endless martyrdom. More than once, I was at the point of fleeing from it. There is, they say, a special department of providence for the protection of fools. It is providence, no wisdom of my own, that I have to thank that I am not still a vagrant scraping to villagers among the show wagons. The plans mapped out for me succeeded in spite of myself. At last the time arrived when it was said, now we will commence. Of course, I had come to my senses before this. So far from hankering after the tents of my boyhood, I was ashamed to remember that I had ever played in them. So far from picturing fame as the applause of shopkeepers in a shed, I thirsted for something more than the reception accorded me at my debut. Ambition devoured me now. If I had the right to praise myself for anything, it is for the devotion with which I worked during the five years that followed. Well, I made a furor. Audiences rained roses on me and struggled to reach the platform. Great ladies invited me to their receptions and bent their eyes on me as if I were a god. I found it frightfully confusing. Under my veneer, under my fashionable suit, I was still the peasant who had held his cap for coppers. I discovered that it was necessary for me to do more than master my art, that I was required to say interesting things to people who frightened me. My popularity suffered a little because I could not do it. The agent was furious at my bashfulness. You must speak to the ladies as if you were in love with them, he told me, or if you cannot do that, be rude, make an effect somehow. You answer as if you were a servant. Many of my eccentric remarks that you have heard, Duchess, have been composed with difficulty and practiced with care. The world will not have us as we are. My agent often returns a portrait poster of me to the printer with the instructions, put more soul into the eyes. I am coming to my love story. It was no further back than last year that I first met her. I had given a recital at Blythe Point and was remaining there for a few days rest. One evening, I went to a variety of entertainment in the pavilion on the pier. In the bill were three girls described as the three sisters Clicquot. They appeared as theater attendants, the program sellers who show you to your box, and sang to a rather plaintive air that they once hoped to be stars themselves. And then, having blossomed into gauze and spangles, they burlesqued melodrama. After their turn, Two of the trio came into the stalls, and, by chance, I spoke to one of them. A strong man had broken a sixpence in halves and thrown the pieces over the footlights. The girl asked me to let her see the piece that I had picked up. I do not suppose I exchanged twenty words with her, and certainly I gave no thought to the incident. But a night or two later, I drifted onto the pier again and came face to face with her after the performance was over. She greeted me gaily. Hello, have you been in front? No, I said, I am only strolling. Where are your sisters? Are they really your sisters? Oh no, she answered. It's Nina Clicquot's show. Good name to choose, eh? The other girl, Eva Jones, and I are engaged by her, that's all. This is my card. From a battered perch, she took a card on which was printed, Miss Betty Williams, the three sisters Clicquot. We were near the entrance to the buffet. Will you come and have a drink? I asked. Oh, I don't think I will, thanks, she said. I'm waiting for Eva. I might miss her. Oh, you'd better come, I said. We went in and sat down at one of the tables. She did not strike me as particularly good-looking then. The spell of her face lay in its changefulness, and as yet I had not seen it change, for her capabilities as an actress were of the slightest. I saw merely a pale, slim girl, becomingly dressed in some dark stuff that was rather shabby. When she lifted her brandy and soda, 
a fingertip showed through a glove. I wondered why I had brought her in, and was glad that there was no crowd to recognize me. It wasn't until she told me so that I was sure she recognized me herself. She said, I have never heard you play. I should love to. Did you get many people in down here? I couldn't help smiling. Yet it had a pleasant ring, that question. It revived the past, the days when I used to see the takings divided on the drum. Oh, she exclaimed, laughing. I forgot. Of course you did. I'm not used to talking to big guns. But there was no embarrassment in her apology. She might have been living among big guns all her life. How long have you been at it? I asked her. The halls? Three years, she said. I was on the stage for a little while, not that I was up to much. I was the starving heroine once. The manager said I was the worst leading lady he had ever seen, but that I looked the part because I was all bones. I am a skeleton, aren't I? I chucked the stage. The halls pay much better, and my voice isn't bad. Of course, it's not a trained voice, but it isn't too bad, eh? We have two shows a night next week. That means five pounds to me. Good for little Betty. By the way, she was not little. What do you do with the money? One must say something. Oh, I've plenty to do with it, she said. A husband to keep? Give us a chance, she laughed. No, but mother doesn't make much by the shop anymore. She's a costumier, and there are the kids to bring up. I have two young brothers. She did well once. I used to go up west to try for engagements, dressed to kill. She lent me the models to put on. I often didn't have a twopence in my pocket, but I looked a treat. The only thing was, I was so afraid of its raining, then we couldn't sell the model. You've had hard times, I said, interested. She nodded gravely. Rough. I've always found very good pals, though. When I went into the course at the regalia, I and a friend of mine had an ascent between us for bus fares, and there was an old Johnny, one of the syndicate, who took to us. Quite straight. He said, Look here, I know you two girls aren't getting enough to eat. I've booked a table at the truck and you're both to lunch there right through the rehearsals. If you can't get away for lunch, it's to be dinner, but one square meal a day the two of you must have regularly, or there'll be rows. Mind, it isn't to be a meal for more than two. Her face lit with laughter. There were some boys in the chorus just as stony as we were. My friend would lunch one day, I'd lunch the next, we'd each take a boy in turn. But the old man found out what was going on, and the trot was off. I've had cases of champagne sent to me, if you please. He was a wine merchant's son, wanted to marry me. His screw in the f business was about a pound a week. Nice little fellow. He always called me Jack. He used to say, I can't come in the pit to see the show tonight. I haven't got a bob. But have a case of champagne, Jack. I'll send you one round. It doesn't cost me anything. I liked it. For years, I had conversed with only two kinds of women, the women who awed me and the women who were odd. In five minutes, I was as spontaneous as she. Her tones were, for the most part, very pleasant, and now that she was animated, the play of her features fascinated me. When we had finished our drinks, we sauntered round and round the pavilion. The performing birds are on, she said as we caught the music. I hate that show. I hate an audience for standing it. Don't they know it's cruel? Performing birds make me think of the first bird you see die. You're a child. It's generally the first time you've looked at death. You bury your bird in the garden, and you line a grave with flowers, so that the horrid earth shan't touch it. Her voice fell to a whisper. By the burst of applause that reached us in the moonlight, I knew that the pavilion was packed. That's Heracles, the strong man, she said, as we listened again. What did you think of him? He's in love with my sister. I mean, Eva Jones. He wanted to kiss her, and she put on side. Oh, Eva was very haughty. Sir, how dare you? He had hold of her finger, and he drew her to him as if she had been a piece of paper. It was so funny to see her going. 
He worshipped the ground she walks on, fact. That was the reason his challenge night was a frost. Didn't you hear about his challenge night? He bet that no twelve men in Blythe Point could pull him over the line. Then he got drunk because she wouldn't have anything to do with him, and they pulled him all over the place. It cost him ten pounds, beside his reputation. He cried. Ah, little girl, he said to her, it is all through you. It was amazing that on the stage she could not act. As I heard her tell this story, I would have sworn she was a born comedian. The exaggerated dignity of Miss Jones, its ludicrous collapse, the humiliation of the strong man, she brought the scenes before me. Go on, I begged. Talk some more. But before she could talk much more, the obdurate Miss Jones appeared. I was presented and wished them good night. I could have seen them to their lodging, but, well, Miss Jones's attire was not to my taste, and she had forgotten to take the makeup off her eyes. I am writing more than I intended. I had no idea my explanation would be so long. The next night I did walk to their lodging with them. It was Saturday, their last night in the town. On Monday, they were to sing in a London suburb. Miss Jones had to leave a parcel with an acquaintance at the Theatre Royale, and, in her absence, Betty Williams and I paced the street alone. For a quarter of an hour, perhaps. She was looking forward to the week at home. She was serious tonight. She talked to me of her mother and the boys. I said I hoped she would find them well. And we shook hands. Goodbye. The incident seemed closed, but I went away with an impression I had never experienced before. The impression of having met someone who ought to have been my very good friend. When I breakfasted on the morrow, I felt blank in realizing that her train had already gone. Every day I had to combat a temptation to run up to that suburb. When my holiday came to an end, I wondered if she was in town still. By a music hall paper, I ascertained that the three sisters Clicquot were in Derby. Each week I bought the paper to learn the movements of the three sisters Clicquot. In each week I told myself it would be absurd of me to follow her so far. Eventually, I followed her to Yorkshire. What a town! The grey grim streets, the clatter of the clogs, the woman's hopeless faces under the shawls. I put up at a commercial hotel, there was nothing else, and was directed to the Empire. Their name was far down the program. Number 10, the Three Sisters Clicquot. I began to think that I should never reach it. Number 8 proved to be a conjurer, and my heart sank as I beheld the multitude of articles that he meant to use before he finished. Number 9 was a troop of acrobats. A dozen times they made their bows and skipped off only to skip on again and do some more. At last, the number 10 was displayed. The little plaintive symphony stole from the orchestra. The three sisters filed on, Eva Jones, next Miss Clicquot, then Betty. I wondered if she would notice me. I saw her start. She smiled. I was so pleased that I had gone. She talked presently in the passage under the stage. She was very much surprised. I did not tell her that I was there only to meet her again. Once more, I walked with her and Eva Jones to the door. In the morning, I called on them. There were luncheons in the private room that I had been able to secure at the hotel. I went to tea with them at their apartments. In fine, I was very much in love, and I knew that I had been a fool. I knew it for a reason which will be difficult for you to credit, Duchess. This girl who took a brandy and soda with a stranger in a bar, who accepted little presents from others, and dined with men who had only one motive for inviting her, remained perfectly virtuous. In different classes there are different codes. She did not regard her behavior as wrong. More, if she had committed the act which she knew to be wrong, she would have broken her heart. No matter how much a man cares for a girl, she said to me once, he can't have her any more sacred than she holds herself at the beginning. A girl saves herself for a man she is thinking of. She hasn't seen him. In all probability, she never will see him. 
but she is saving herself for him, the imaginary man, from her head to her heels. You shouldn't tell me I shouldn't do this, and I shouldn't do the other. I don't do any harm. If you knew how dull it is on tour, you'd understand my taking all the fun I can get. When a fellow asks me to lunch, I go. I say I'll go with another girl that tells him everything, doesn't it? I swear to God, I've only let one man kiss me in my life. And then I only did it out of pity because he was so cut up. A man is never dangerous till he's beaten. Do you know that? Well, I was not prepared to marry her, and she could be nothing to me if I didn't. I left Yorkshire with the firm intention of never seeing her any more. However, I missed her dreadfully, and at the end of a month, I succumbed again. I went to Lancashire this time. The same impatience in my stall, the same quiver of expectancy at the plaintive introduction that was so familiar now, the same throb as the three girls appeared. Why should I bore you with the details? I was with her all day, every day. Tea and chatter in the lodging became an institution, and we grew serious only when the melancholy dusk signaled her departure for the hall. She was not fascinated by her career. How I hate going in, she murmured sometimes, as we reached the artist's entrance, with a group of loafers spinning on the curb. And I sat in front, just to see the turn, and talk to her again between the first performance and the second, in the passage at the foot of the dirty steps, where such draughts poured through the slamming door, and the gas jet blew crooked in its cage. She was fond of me. I knew it. I had only to ask her to marry me. I knew that her consent wouldn't be due to my position. There were moments when I was very near to asking her. But I was Sokolowski, and she a third-rate variety artist. I shuddered to think what the society ladies would say if their god stooped. For that matter, what everybody would say. No woman could have been more different than the wife I had pictured. Yet no woman had ever been so truly a companion to me. Always a bohemian at heart, I had naturally fallen in love with a bohemian. But when he draws a portrait of the wife that he desires, every man is conventional. Besides, you, and great ladies like you, had made me a snob. She drove with me to the station on the day I left. She knew I wouldn't go to her again. I heard it in her voice. That was the only time I felt dull when I was with her. We both could have said so much and were allowed to say so little. I remember the look in her eyes as the train crept from the platform. I shall always remember the look in her eyes as she smiled on the platform. Even a weak man may be strong sometimes. In the wrong place, I stuck to my resolve. At first, I still glanced at the encore just to know where she was, but before long I denied myself this too. My American tour started soon afterwards. The change helped me while it lasted, but when I came back the struggle was as bad as ever. Six months had passed, and yet every day I hungered to see her. I was desperate. I didn't know what to do to keep myself in hand. Duchess, my motive in addressing you is to write the truth even the truth that one blushes to acknowledge. When I welcomed the dawn of your interest in me, I turned to you as a chance of forgetting her. I did not mean to prove so obtuse as I appeared last night. Perhaps a gentleman might have seized the chance too, but, I suppose, only a cad would own it to you afterwards. And I couldn't forget. I never responded to your gaze without wishing it were hers. I resented the very gowns that you received me in, because she was so poorly dressed. I hated myself for being in your drawing room while she was trudging through the rain. My God! It's awful to think like that of a woman, to have the thought of her beset you as you open your eyes in the morning, to think till you're worn out with thinking of her, and pray to think of something else, to think of her till you want to escape from your own mind. Tolerate me a little longer. I have nearly done. Last Saturday, it was a year since I had seen her. I broke down. I was ready to make her my wife. I wondered if she would look as pleased as she used to look when she saw me. 
and then I froze at the thought that the three sisters Clicquot might be abroad, that they might have vanished altogether. When I searched the encore again, I... There were emotions. The three sisters Clicquot. I found it. They were in Portsmouth on Saturday. Yesterday they were to be in town. It was impossible for me to go to Portsmouth. My prayer was that, after my recital yesterday, I may reach the London Hall before she left. I had no means of knowing whether their turn would be late or early. All through that recital I was torn with the fear that I might miss her. The audience delayed me beyond endurance. I was trembling when I escaped from them. I stumbled into the carriage and told the man to drive like mad. He couldn't find the stage door, and, too impatient to keep still, I leapt out and went to the box office. It was all right. They hadn't been on yet. There could be no chance to speak to her until the turn was over. Just as I used to do, I sat down to wait in the stalls. Just as I used to do, I read the name of the three sisters Clicquot in a program and wished that the preceding turn didn't last so long. I had taken it for granted that they would be giving a different song now, and my heart tightened at the greeting of that familiar symphony again. For an instant, I could not look at the stage. I knew, with my head bent, the moment when the three girls filed on. I knew where they were moving, how they were standing. Now the note that they were going to sing! I looked up for Betty's face and saw a stranger. Oh, the horrible woman, the low, horrible woman. And I had to watch her. I watched her in spite of myself. The audience laughed and shouted while I sat there with the sickness of terror in me, while I watched that horrible woman posturing in Betty's place and wearing the frock that Betty had worn. Afterwards, I found the artist's entrance, as I had proposed to find it, only I asked for Eva instead of Betty. She came down to me smiling in her stage costume. Who'd have thought of seeing you? She exclaimed as we shook hands. I was just going to change. How are you? I said dully, and our eyes questioned each other. I suppose you know about Betty, she said. I could only look at her. She's dead, she told me. The last turn was on. A comedian was bellowing doggerel. I listened to bars of it before I whispered. Dead? She got typhoid when we were in Lincoln. She died last month. Hadn't you heard? No. It's still the three sisters Clicquot on the bills. Oh yes, of course. It's always the three sisters Clicquot. The new girl's not as good as Betty was, don't you think so? I don't know. The comedian was dancing now. I heard the rattle of his feet. Shabby, pasty-faced men kept hurrying past us through the passage, up the dirty steps. The door at the top was slamming, and the gas jet blew crooked in its cage. It was strange to be among these things and not see Betty. Goodbye, I said. Did she ever talk of me after I went? Sometimes. She wasn't the girl to say much. Betty liked you, though. I liked Betty, I said. Well, well, she said, I must get along and change. Buck up. And then I went to you, your grace. I had promised to play to your guests, and I could not break my word. But you must understand what I was feeling while I played, that my thoughts were in a grave. And when we were alone... You may understand that, though you are charming and beautiful and a duchess, and exalted me by your caprice, I could not be guilty of that outrage, that adultery towards the dead. Most humbly, I beg you to believe that I am grateful for the honor you have done a man who was unworthy, who was loyal neither to you nor to her. You will never pardon me for this letter. Goodbye. End of chapter 11